want to start off by uh, thanking the organizers for the invitation to come and tell you a bit about Lyme disease and the work we're doing here uh, at the Trudeau Institute in collaboration with Paul Smith's College and the New York State Department of Health and uh, really structured this as a, a Lyme disease 101, uh, what it is, where it is, uh, how you contract it, and uh, most importantly, how do you protect yourself uh, against infection. So just to give you a little bit of a, a historical perspective, and, and Dr. Krant uh, alluded to, to some of this information, it's actually in Europe, uh, there's a skin rash that's very similar to that of the erythema migrans rash uh, associated with Lyme disease. And that has been described in the European medical literature dating all the way back to the turn of the 20th century. So this has been around for a very long time. Uh, Lyme disease may have actually spread from Europe to the United States in the early 1900s, but it's really uh, only more recently uh, been recognized by health experts as a distinct illness from the tick-borne disease uh, that individuals get in Europe. It was really uh, first recognized in 1975 uh, as uh, an infectious entity. Uh, this was really uh, the driving force behind identifying Lyme disease uh, in the United States was through the efforts of uh, a mother of one of these large uh, numbers of children in Lyme, Connecticut, uh, reaching out to uh, Alan Steer, who at the time was at uh, Yale University. and. Uh, what they recognized is that most of the affected children that were originally uh, diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or oligoarthritis uh, lived and played near wooded areas. Uh, their symptoms typically started in the summer and months, and uh, many of them developed a skin rash after being bitten by a tick. And it was actually not until uh, 1982 that uh, investigations discovered that the deer tick, uh, or the black-legged tick, uh, was actually infected with a spiral-shaped bacterium that uh, Dr. Ledette showed you, uh, this spirochetal pathogen uh, known as Borrelia burgdorferi. It's actually named after the uh, entomologist Willy Burgdorfer that, uh, along with investigators at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, uh, were able to identify as the causative agent of Lyme disease. And uh, unfortunately, just last month, uh, Dr. Bergdorfer had passed away after many, many decades of making uh, seminal contributions to our understanding of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. Uh, Lyme disease is obviously a clear, present, and growing danger, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in North America with an upwardly revised number of approximately 300,000 confirmed and probable cases occurring annually in the United States. Lyme disease is present in nearly all states, but the vast majority of cases are reported in the mid-Atlantic states into the northeastern states, so essentially from Virginia north to Maine and west into Pennsylvania and also the north central states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. The spread and the intensity of the disease is really dependent upon the distribution and the population sizes of the primary vector, Ixodes scapularis, and the main reservoir host, Paramiscus leucopus, of Borrelia burgdorferi. So the main reservoir host, uh, Paramiscus leucopus, is the white-footed mouse. Also an important element of the transmission of Lyme disease is that there is necessary habitat and environmental conditions for both populations, the population of ticks and the small mammals, to survive to maintain the Borrelia enzootic cycle in a particular area. And in the period from 2004 to 2013, uh, a little over 40,000 cases have been reported in New York State. And it's important to note that this case number here over this roughly 10-year period of time does not take into account the multiplier factor of 10 that the CDC has now applied. So it's more likely that over this 10-year span of time in New York State, 
we've seen closer to 400,000 cases of Lyme disease. And New York is consistently one of the top five case reporting states. And perhaps most important to this audience here, number of cases outside uh, historically endemic areas in New York are on the rise. So this is a map that sort of shows these areas of, uh, or hot spots of, of Lyme disease and not surprisingly other tick-borne diseases in the United States. Uh, it's important to note that each dot uh, is simply randomly placed within the county of residence for each confirmed case of Lyme disease. So though Lyme disease cases have been reported in nearly every state, it's important to understand when you're looking at a map like this that cases are reported based on the county of residence, not necessarily the county of infection. And so what that means is, although there are dots spread all throughout the United States, some of these individuals in these very remote areas may have been uh, on vacation in New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maine, New Hampshire, where they acquired the tick that was infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. So they may have been infected out here or up here, but their case is logged as having occurred within the state and the county where they lived. Uh, in 2013, fully 95% of the confirmed Lyme disease cases were reported in just 14 states. So this is body of work that's been done by the New York State Department of Health over a period of 20 years. And what they've done is they have <coughs> shown the incidence of Lyme disease per 100,000 population uh, from 1986 through 2005 on the basis of zip codes. And I know each of these little maps of New York State are small, but as we roll them out for each five-year period, what I want you to notice is that back in 1986, the incidence of Lyme disease was primarily on Long Island and in and around New York City. And as you go year over year, you start to see the spread of Ixodes scapularis ticks and thus the spread of the pathogens that the tick carries throughout New York State. You can see how that just increases in the distribution and also the intensity of color, meaning the number of individuals that are infected for every 100,000 in the population. So how about here in the ADK? This map here, which was generated by Dr. Ledette, breaks New York State into the different Department of <coughs> Environmental Conservation areas. And we've got the blue line of the ADK here. And what I want to point out is that in areas where Lyme disease has been endemic for a very long period of time, like on Long Island or around the city, and also to some extent in Dutchess County and Columbia County, the incidence of Lyme disease over these five-year periods of time has either decreased or plateaued. But in the Adirondack Park, and this is work uh, data that was actually parsed out of the CDC database by students uh, from Paul Smith's College, we see that from 1992 up to 2011, there's actually been a significant increase in the incidence of human Lyme disease in the ADK. So the vector itself, as we've heard, is Ixodes scapularis, and the black-legged tick not only can transmit the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, but also babesiosis, human granulocytic anaplasmosis, and more recently, deer tick virus, which is a kissing cousin of the Powassan encephalitis virus. So not only can the Ixodes scapularis tick 
transmit bacterial pathogens to us. They can transmit pathogens that are similar to malaria and also viruses. As we heard from Dr. Ledet's presentation, the ticks will rise to the tops of uh, grass and twigs and take on this questing posture in preparation for latching on to uh, small mammals. Uh, you can get a sense of the size of the ticks, the very small size of the ticks, uh, feeding on the ear of this small mammal. And the ticks uh, have a number of uh, sensory organs on the ends of their legs, which allows them to detect changes in temperature and carbon dioxide. And not surprisingly, uh, there are wide areas of the United States, uh, particularly the Northeast and the Midwest Central States, that uh, provide very <coughs> ideal environments for the black-legged uh, tick to survive. So if we think about the seasonal life cycle of uh, Ixodes scapularis ticks, and again, here's the larvae, the nymph, the adult male, and the adult female. We see that we start uh, the activity of the ticks in March and April. These are the adult ticks that just overwintered. So it's in these uh, early spring months, late spring months, that they are out questing for a blood meal. The majority of the nymphal ticks are questing for their blood meal of the season in June, July, and August. The larval ticks that have hatched from the eggs that the female laid after overwintering are starting to quest in July and especially August, September, October. And then you've got another wave of adult ticks that are active in October, November, and really through December. So given this seasonal life cycle of Ixodes scapularis ticks, it's not surprising that the seasonal incidence of Lyme disease is actually greatest in June, July, and August. And these numbers represent confirmed Lyme disease cases by month of disease onset uh, from 2001 to 2010. And this is the classic bullseye rash. Uh, one uh, point to make about uh, this infectious process is the reason it's called erythema migrans, erythema referring to the redness of the rash migrans because it migrates out from the site of the tick bite. Lyme disease is what we call a possibacillary infection. It means it takes very, very few spirochetes transmitted from the salivary glands into your body to cause <laughs> disease. And when those spirochetes get into that site of inoculation, it elicits this inflammatory response from the body and cells from your bloodstream want to move into the tissue to try and kill and clear the bacteria. So not surprisingly, the bacteria want to get out of there as quickly as possible. So the spirochetes are actually migrating away from this site of inoculation and one of the few times that you can detect them in the patient is when they're right at the leading edge of that red rash. So it's like taking a stone and throwing it into a pond and seeing the ripples migrating out from the center of where that stone hit the water. In terms of acquisition and prevention, um, as Dr. Krant alluded to, hiking, camping, fishing, uh, anything that you're doing outdoors is really going to increase uh, the likelihood of coming in contact with ticks. There's no vaccine uh, for humans available, uh, unlike uh, what's available for our domestic pets. The Lymerx vaccine was withdrawn from the market in 2002. Uh, antibiotics can be very effective, particularly doxycycline and ceftriaxone. Uh, but they are most effective when administered early after infection. And just to continue the mantra that you've heard throughout the talks today, really the most effective approach is to minimize exposure, to spray, and to check for ticks. 
And with that, I'll take any questions along with the rest of the group.